Welcome to the Black Love Matters project and presentation brought to you by the Carl Spain Center. For those who don't know me, my name is Kip Kiplagat, and I am the current executive assistant for the Carl Spain Center. And I have a panel that will be joining me today to do this presentation. And I will allow them to go ahead and introduce themselves. So starting off with Marilyn, would you please take the stage and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi guys, uh, my name is Marilyn Allen. I'm a junior social work major uh, at ACU and I'm an intern at the Carl Spain Center. My name is Roland Campos. Uh, I'm a senior information systems major here at ACU and I'm also an intern. And I'm Alex Boglin. I'm a junior management marketing major here at ACU and I'm also an intern. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, that's the team. And initially, we had planned to have this event last month during the month of love, and also Black History Month. But due to the winter storm, we had to uh, change that. But the main purpose of this presentation today is to kind of highlight how Bell Hooks, um, this amazing, wonderful author, has constructed this piece of work called All About Love that has been guiding us to this new vision and new insight of viewing love and how we can love ourselves and become better people at loving others and showing that love to the world in a way that is pure, whole, and transformative. And for those who might not know who Bell Hooks is, she originally goes by the name Gloria Jean Watkins, but she's better known as her, um, you know, author name, Bell Hooks. And she's an American author, professor, feminist, and social activist. And like I said, we chose this book because of the phenomenal insight she has as a scholar and her understanding to engage this discussion on love from the perspective of a woman of color in an American context. And basically what this book is about is that it provides radical new ways to think about the art of loving, offering a hopeful, joyous vision of love and its transformative power. It helps us to know what we must do to love again, gathering love's wisdom. It also lets us know what we must do to be touched by love's grace. So as we start this presentation, we're gonna go ahead and start with a definition of love that we will be using throughout this presentation. So just give me a second to set this up. Okay. So the first question that we want to address is, what is love? And from this book, we will use this, this definition as our guideline for defining love. And it is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. And as we were studying this book for this presentation, we came up with four questions that we wanted to address to kind of highlight what this book talks about and how it can be used to answer these questions in our context and from our own personal experiences of how it can be um, applicable on ACU's campus. So the first question we seek to answer is, how do we love ourselves? As I read this book, uh, Bell Hooks brought up the fact that the reason that most people struggle to love is because there is confusion about what we mean when we use the word love. It is the source of our difficulty in loving. And she suggests that if we want to go back to the heart of loving, to understanding a love that is pure and correct, we first have to define it. And she says, we need clarity we must transform our definition of love, understanding it not as a noun, but as a verb, understanding that it is not instinctive, 
but it is an act of will and intention. Love isn't passive. It's an active choice to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. She mentions how definitions are a vital starting point for this imagination. And what we cannot imagine cannot come into being. And a good definition marks our starting point and lets us know where we want to end up. And we need this map as a guide on this journey of love because it will give us a starting point and it will help us to know where we're going as we seek out this love. And as we pursue this clear and defined version of love that we're seeking, she says, the first place it will take us to is the first school of love that we ever attended, which is our childhood. And there, that's where we need to do the self inventory assessment. She mentions how we learn about love in childhood first, whether our homes are happy or troubled, our families are functional or dysfunctional. It's the original school of love. And from that, we see how our parents played a big role in teaching us these things, whether subconsciously or consciously. And these things follow us up until today. And it's not until that we go back and do the self inventory of seeing, why do I tend to see love in this way? Or how am I, you know, reactive to love today because of the way I was taught? These are things that we all have to do assessments on to understanding why we view ourselves, the way we view ourselves, and how we can first love ourselves before we can love others. And in that process, we have to be honest with ourselves. She mentions how the heart of justice requires telling truth, seeing ourselves in the way the world is rather than the way we want it to be. And if one's goal is self-recovery, to be well in one's soul, honestly and realistically, confronting lovelessness is a part of this healing process. That's my turn. In Bell Hook's commitment chapter, she opens with the phrase, if you don't love yourself, you'll be unable to love anyone else. Most of, most of us have heard something like this before, but before reading this chapter, I was confused on how one must love themselves and how that will turn into a communal love. Hook says that self-love starts with self-acceptance. She says that self-acceptance is hard because we always have that little voice in our head that's constantly judging our decisions or our actions. These thoughts allow us to believe that these critiques are realistic, even more than the positive thoughts that, or the encouragement or the you know, pick-me-ups that we use that we give ourselves all the time. But when we fully begin to accept ourselves, we begin to take responsibility in all areas of our lives. This is taking responsibility in our actions, our attainment of goals, our lives, and our well-being. Bell Hook says that self-love is the foundation of the love practice. When we begin to start to give ourselves unconditional love, that is truly when we begin to love others. In the book, she says, when we give ourselves this precious gifts, we are able to reach out to others from a place of fulfillment and not from a place of lack. She says that when she hit her 40s, she saw herself as fat, too this, too that, too ugly, too unattractive, but she fantasized about finding a partner who would love her for who she is. She says that she was asking someone to give her acceptance and affirmation that she was withholding from herself. And that is when she realized that you were unable to love others without loving yourself. Bell Hooks ends the chapter by saying, not everyone is taught self-love, but there is still hope. Hope to find love in yourself, even when you feel like your biggest enemy. Even in the darkest room, the light of love is always present. How do we love ourselves? This is a question that resonates with me, and I'm assuming that it's one that many other people have thought of, of at some point in their lives. But a good majority of my life uh, growing up, I was put in predominantly white spaces. I went to a predominantly white school, predominantly white church, and a lot of the shows that I watched growing up had predominantly white characters. So from a young age, the idea was placed in my head that I was the outsider, I was the one that was different. And throughout the book, Bell Hooks talks a, a little bit about how 
being able to receive love as well as giving it <clears throat> and finding community within ourselves in order to healthily partake in community with others. And there's a passage in the book where she says, we all long for love and community. It enhances life's joy. But many of us seek a community solely to escape the fear of being alone. So like I said, I never really grew up in too many environments that taught me how to see myself the way that God sees me and how to love my skin and take pride in my blackness. Because of this, I found myself chasing acceptance in ways that not only were, weren't true to who I was, but detrimental to my view on myself and also people like me. She raises a good point that I personally uh, have had difficulty grasping at times in regards to this idea of solitude versus loneliness. And what she says is loneliness is painful and solitude is peaceful. <clears throat> and what I get out of that is in order to love ourselves well, we need to learn to become comfortable with ourselves and to view our alone time as a time of growth to be taken advantage of instead of a burden. Yeah, whenever I think of <clears throat> answering the question of, you know, loving ourselves, I think of us um, as a community and us as just college students, you know, um, whenever we think of, you know, just loving ourselves as a college student, it's, it can be kind of tough, especially whenever we're, you know, surrounded by stress and surrounded by, you know, just maybe sometimes uncomfortable spaces, but this quote that I have here at the bottom of the slide actually comes from the healing chapter um, of All About Love. And it says, it is simply that the initial gesture of taking responsibility for our own well-being, wherein we confess to our brokenness, our woundedness, and open ourselves to salvation must be made by the individual. So this, this isn't something that, you know, obviously other people can help us with it and having that community around you is important. But the decision to love ourselves, for it to truly be, you know, the profound and life altering decision that it is and the life altering decision that it was for Bell Hooks, you know, she she proclaims that it has to be made by the individual for it to begin to be um, making that healing, you know, to make you a better person. And, you know, it could also just grow your relationship with God uh, as a Christian. Thank you, Roland. And the next question that we asked ourselves is, after I start loving myself, after I start seeking ways and healing myself and allowing my individuality to reconstruct this image of love, how can I then express that love to others? And as we've seen, it, it takes a lot to first do that within ourselves. So Bell Hooks also assists us on different ways in which we can do that with others. And one of the ways she uh, assists us in doing so is that she mentions that the first or a very big connection into loving others is that justice has to be shared between those two people. She mentions how justice between people is perhaps the most important connection people can have. Without justice, there can be no love. Loving justice for yourself and for others enables us to break the chokehold of patriarchal or toxic masculinity. And as many of you have, as many of y'all know, um, patriarchy has dealt a lot of blows and wounds to people on earth. Um, we've seen a lot of people be degraded, people be um, chastised and separated and divided and so many different ugly things come about that. And when we're not seeking justice for these people that are being oppressed by such systems, when we're not doing anything to help them, when we see consistent you know, violence perpetrated to specific people groups here in America, how can we claim to love them when we're seeing them 
unjustly being persecuted. And Bell Hooks con consistently mentions that justice has to be present if we truly love others. And a commonly accepted assumption in patriarchal culture is that love can be present in a situation where one group or individual dominates another. And we've seen that to be false. And, you know, recent events have brought light to just how people still believe that to be true. And that is not the case. She mentions a quote from a psycho, psycho psychoanalyst, Carl Jung, who mentions that where the will to power is paramount, love will be lacking. Domination will only create barriers between us and the experience of love. And our culture, our culture um, promotes dishonesty and celebrates materialism, making it hard for us to feel love. Our society promotes men and women to lie to one another. But to know love, we have to tell the truth to ourselves and to others. And more than ever before, we as a society need to renew a commitment to truth telling. To be loving, we willingly have to hear each other's truth. And most important, we have to affirm the value of truth telling between us and others for there to be wholesome and pure love to be present in those situations. One important aspect of loving others is honesty. We need to learn to be more honest with those who we love. Hook says that as a society, we like honesty. In today's world, we're taught that we need to fear the truth and that it's always going to hurt. Even as children, we learn that if we're too honest, it leads to punishment. So we learn to avoid the truth and that we need to be fearful of honesty. Bill Hook says to create this, that, that dishonesty creates a false image of yourself. To know love, we have to tell the truth to ourselves and others. Creating a false self to mask fears and insecurities has become so common that many of us forget who we are and how we feel underneath. Dishonesty has become so common that we're unable to tell the truth to small questions like, how are you? How are you feeling? Are you okay? Hooks adds that commitment to telling the truth lies in the groundwork for openness and honesty. And that is the heartbeat of love. As a society, we need to learn to renew the commitment of telling the truth. Dishonesty may make people feel better, but it does not let us know love. And this is actually a very profound question for Bell Hooks, you know, to be asking and for us to be answering because um, if y'all don't know, Bell Hooks is, um, she describes herself as a pretty traumatizing, in the past, she was a very broken woman. You know, she comes from a household uh, that she says was abusive and her relationships in her adulthood at first, you know, they were, they were toxic and they just weren't a good situation for her to be in. And thank God, you know, she got out of those and, and learned and wrote this book for us to, to be able to make it through stuff like that. And, you know, she answers this by saying, no matter what has happened in our past, when we open our hearts to love, we can live as if born again, not forgetting the past, but not forgetting our past, but seeing it in a new way and letting it live inside us in a new way. And this is something that, especially as a black community, uh, can really can really help us uh, get out of this kind of funk we've been in, you know, in this nation. Um, you know, our nation is riddled with um, just horrible, horrible events. And, you know, some people try to tell us to just forget them because they happened a long time ago, but we know that's something we can't stand for. That's something we can't do, but we can try to, you know, get past them, be forgiving and to be able to love the people around us, regardless of what they look like or regardless of what they may have said in the past, because that's what God calls us to do um, as Christians and as, and as his children. Throughout the book, Bell Hooks seems to put a pretty big emphasis on community and family and the importance of all of our meaningful relationships, not just romantic ones. Um, a passage that really stuck out to me from her, she says, what we learn through experience is that our capacity to establish deep and profound connections and friendship strengthens all our intimate bonds. And from that, what I believe she's getting at is that the amount of love you give doesn't need to vary depending on the relationship because at the end of the day, no matter who you're with, 
the core aspects of love are usually uh, usually are still required trust respect commitment and so on <clears throat> this stuck with me because i believe that we've grown up in a world where the term love is a bit limited and not all encompass all encompassing of what it is and what it can be uh, true genuine and healthy love at its core is for all of our relationships one relationship does not deserve more care and effort than another uh, when we do this we're inhibiting something that has the potential to be life-changing from ourselves and others. Yes, certain relationships uh, may require different behaviors, but the foundations that love is built on should be applied to all of our relationships. Our third question that we are asking and answering um, is how do we love spiritually? Bell Hook says that our nation is in need of a spiritual awakening. She says that America has been taken over by consumerism we have found more value in our materials instead of our spiritual selves. Bell Hook says that a culture that is dead to love only can be resurrected by, spirit, by, a, by a spiritual awakening. To do this, we must remember that God is love and love is everything. Hook says that when we commit to a spiritual life, we are committing to the practice of love. A commitment to a spiritual life necessarily means we embrace an eternal pr principle that love is all, everything, our true destiny. Another aspect that she mentions is that spiritual awakening does not have to be connected to an organized religion. We meditate, we pray, we go to church, we take communion. These are all ways to, to connect to your spiritual well-being. All awakening to love is spiritual awakening. It uncovers the radiant, joyful heart within each of us and manifests that radiance to the world. When we are spiritually filled, we are able to love. Yeah, and just as Raylan has mentioned that love you know like it requires this spiritual aspect to it and as you read the book you will see bell hooks consistently bringing that out and as christians um i feel like for those who you know profess to be christians we've seen how love is definitely a spiritual thing and bell hooks assist us to explore that spiritual reality in, within this book she mentions how love is not physical but requires that spiritual nurturing and as we've mentioned before, it requires a spiritual awakening. And the beauty of um, the, the Christian scripture is that we get this from First John chapter 4, verse 19, where we are able to have this spiritual capacity to love because God loved us first. And because of that, we can then enact in this spiritual seeking out of our own nourishment and that of others. Another be uh, beautiful thing of how we can love spiritually um, that, that Bell Hooks helps us address is being able to speak truth. Um, just that simplicity in speaking truth is a spiritual act in itself. See, advertising in today's society has sanctioned some of the biggest lies um, that we've ever witnessed. And our passive acceptance of lies in public life, particularly via the mass media, oppose and perpetuates lying in our private lives. And just by that simple and honest way of just telling the truth, speaking truth, that in itself is a spiritual act of how we can love ourselves and love others. And as we all know, um, the spirit of God is described as a spirit of truth. And when we participate in truth telling, we're participating in that action of unifying our spirit with God and allowing his truth to act within us through love. And when men and women punish each other for telling truth, for truth telling, we reinforce the notion that lies are better. And this is contrary to living a life that is in the pursuit of God and practicing and participating in a love that is as pure as his. And that's one thing that Bell Hooks helps us see is how <clears throat> lying, <clears throat> excuse me, lying has become so pervasive in today's society and how people opt to lie because it's easier. But the simple act of just truth telling within relationships within, you know, ourselves, that within itself is giving us the capacity to be honorable to the God who has loved us and is allowing us to 
participate in love. And sometimes that's just, that's just how easy it is. Just the simple fact that we can speak love and speak truth. We're actually doing justice to everybody and to ourselves. This question for me personally was definitely a little more difficult to answer. Um, but while I was reading Bell Hooks' words, uh, at one point during the book, she talks about an advertisement that she once saw that used a slogan that spoke to her. And it said, a family that prays together stays together. And she describes prayer as a way to communicate and equates this communication together as a way of making and building community. And I found this interesting and so profound because I believe that prayer can be vulnerable. Prayer allows us the chance to be our most honest selves and having a community to communicate this most authentic version of ourselves um, has the potential to, to create deeper bonds, uh, more intimate relationships and wholeness, not only with others, but also within ourselves. Yeah, and <clears throat> loving spiritually, uh, for me, uh, first of all, I'm going to read you all this quote from the book. It says, um, it is to stare your rough patches in life down and walk through them with love and confidence. Uh, I believe doing this um, is the best way to answer this question because, you know, I think of the Bible and I think of Jesus and how he walked through his life and how it was riddled with, um, with rough patches and hardships. You know, Jesus was an oppressed man. Uh, Jesus was somebody who lived, um, who was homeless, you know, by choice. Um, he chose to stay with uh, people who would take him in. And he did it with love and with dignity, you know, and uh, that's something that we're also called to do as well. And not only to do it by ourselves, but as Alex was mentioning, to do it in community. You know, so this, this really answers our two previous question from earlier. Um, love and spiritually is also called to love yourself and to love the people around you um, because you know we're called to be in community um, in terms of practicing our religion now what does it mean to practice the love ethic after reading all about love uh, when i think about what it really means to practice the love ethic a couple of things that bell hook points out uh, in the book come to mind that helped me better understand what practicing the love ethic could look like during our day-to-day -day lives. So first, the first thing that I took away was discomfort and pain will not cease to exist when we begin our journey back to love. Now, a lot of people are under the impression that love will immediately make all of our problems go away. But Bell Hooks points out that this isn't the case. One of her passages even reads, we have to expose the falseness of these beliefs to see and accept the reality that suffering and pain do not end when we begin to love. In some cases, when we're making the slow journey back from lovelessness to love, our suffering may become more intense. Upon first hearing this, it may seem scary, but the point that Bell Hooks is making is that the acceptance of this possibility makes way for constructive suffering that allows for healthy growth and healing in truth rather than remaining in the, the destructive suffering of lovelessness. But the thing that resonated with me the most from the book is that love is an action. I believe that the words, that words hold power, but love without action will always just be words. This is why there's power in love. It's important for us to realize this and know that love can be tangible and that it isn't something that you just feel. And viewing love in this way allows us to see that we can be physically capable and responsible for creating cultures and environments where the effects 
of this action of love create change and leave lasting impacts. It's crucial for us to view love in this way because only we are responsible for loving each other well. And it is this type of love, passion, commitment, and accountability that creates true change. In a world where blackness is dehumanized, it's important that we unlearn the false narratives that have been told to us to hold us down. We must work to create wholeness within ourselves so that we may love ourselves and each other better. Bollock says that when you practice the love ethic, your life changes. Um, the choices you make are based on honesty, openness, and personal integrity. You learn to value loyalty and become committed to the bonds with others that you have. Embracing the love ethic means that we utilize all dimensions of love, care, commitment, trust, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. We can, we can successfully do this by cultivating awareness. So being fully aware that you're living your life from a standpoint of love can change your perspective. Hook says that when you choose the love to practice love ethic, you are critically examining yourself and your actions. As a society, if we all practice the love ethic, we would let go of our differences and build relationships for the good of all people. Concern for the collective good of, of our nation, city, or neighbor rooted in the values of love makes us all seek to nurture and protect that good. If all public policy was created in the spirit of love, we would not have to worry about unemployment, homelessness, schools failing our children, or um, addiction. We would live in a world that gives love, a world that receives love, a world of love. Um, I truly believe, um, as Marilyn just mentioned, that practicing the love ethic could really change our community, not only as a whole, but, you know, change our community at, at ACU. Um, <clears throat> if we were all able to show um, each other the same care, respect, and uh, just um, uh, the same care, respect, and um, honesty that we could all show each other, um, I believe that it would really um, change up our relationships. It would kind of change the stigma that can be around ACU, you know, for incoming students and uh, students who have been through ACU and have graduated. Uh, I believe it could really change our communities. Yeah, and uh, continuing on with just what everybody has mentioned, living out this love ethic, um, you know, to truly love, we must learn to mix various ingredients, care, affection, recognition, respect, commitment, trust, as well as honest and open communication. And Bell Hooks mentions that the reason people have difficulty with living out a love ethic is because they will see one or two um, of these qualities uh, exemplified in isolation. And she says, that's where we end up thinking that we got it right, but for that wholesome, effective, transformative love to be a reality, it has to be a combination of several ingredients in which I have just mentioned that they cannot exist in isolation. They all have to be working together. And another thing that will assist us in living out this love ethic is that we have to take risks. Um, you know, loving, loving people is hard. Loving people is tough. Loving people is scary. And I'm pretty sure everybody has love stories of how they've been hurt by people they chose to love. But Bell Hooks helps us through this and she mentions that it is only by taking those risks again and again that these wounds can only be healed and they can only be healed through love. And that's just something we have to work with. That's just something we have to struggle with, especially on, you know, um, campus, in America, in the world, just in general, and dealing with the issues that we have to deal with every single day, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to, to do that. But staying away or abstaining from taking these risks will only increase the cynicism that people have for love. And at the end of the day, we will have to do our best, you know, but first we also have to 
remember that we first have to start loving ourselves before we can love others. That's when we can then have the courage and strength to love others. Once we learn how to love ourselves, we can do it in a healthy way and not do it in a careless and toxic way. And at the end of the day, if we wanna practice this love ethic, it all, ha it all has to be shown in the action of it. Uh, Bell Hooks always has this saying in the book that says, love is as love does. The actions of us participating in a love ethic will truly signify that we are participating in one not just in theory, but actually living, living it out in practice and choosing to take love and take an accountability and responsibility for our actions. That's how we can wholesomely participate in this love ethic. And at, that, at this moment, this is where we come to the conclusion of this small presentation that we've uh, done for y'all. Um, I know it's not a very um, wholesome uh, presentation because the book has so much to offer and it has so much to share about the topic and it's just something that we believe that giving us this brief presentation to engage with this audience would hopefully increase some sort of, you know, eager and hunger for people on campus to have these discussions, have these, um, you know, practices and meet together to actually discuss things about love, things that can improve the ways in which we love ourselves, the ways in which we can love others and the way we, and the ways we can improve ACU as a community and living out a love ethic that is beneficial and wholesome for everybody on campus and Eventually, wherever we go, we can carry that on with us to, you know, make an impact in this world because as we can see, the world is hurting. The world needs love and it starts with us. It starts with us learning how to practice this love within ourselves so that we can love others and that they can spread that love to others. Um, so I just want to say thank you for being here with us today. And at this moment, we would like to open up to the audience. If anybody has any feedback or suggestions or questions um, based off of the contents that we have been sharing, or if anybody has read um, Bell Hooks book, All About Love, and would like to share with the audience anything that they got from it, so that those that might have not read the book can be interested in picking it up, you know, sharing it with those that might feel that can benefit from this book. I feel like everybody has an opportunity to benefit from this book. And that's what we want to do. We just want to have these, these discussions to do our part in spreading knowledge, having these moments in which we can be vulnerable with one another and seeking out ways in which we can improve ourselves so that we can be better humans. I see a, a question coming in from Dr. Kelly. He asks this, how did you all identify love as a basic premise for the healing of our community? Um, that's a very powerful question. And I can go ahead and try and take a stab at this, um, but before I take a stab at this, I wanna preface that I'm not necessarily saying I'm an expert at loving. I'm not saying that after reading this material that I got all the answers, um, but she has given me new insight on how I can improve in loving and being a loving person to myself and to others. So how did we identify love as a basic premise for the healing of our community? As I was reading her, her book, she uh, brought up countless um, perspectives and insights as to how the love, how the world or how context she's been in, she's seen how people struggle with love. And especially throughout her childhood, through her adulthood, she realized that the reason a lot of people struggle with love is because 
loving or the definition of love has been something that most people have various connotations and various meanings associated with it. That's why in her first chapter, she begins with clarity. She says, we have to define it because once I understand how you define it, then I can understand where you're coming from. She says that a lot of people can either use it to mean anything. So because it is used so loosely, it doesn't have much weight to it. On the other side, if you're precise, if you're precisely defining it as something that looks like nurturing my own, my own spiritual growth while seeking out to nurture somebody else's spiritual growth, what happens is that it leads you to this place that you eventually have to look yourself in the mirror and realize how much you're not doing that. And that ends up leading you in a path where you have to do the self-assessment. And a lot of people don't like doing that self-assessment because it gets ugly. It reminds them of the past. It reminds them of moments in time where, you know, they were hurt. And some people don't want to go back to that. So she talks about how a lot of people have been wounded by people that were supposed to be loving to them. And that's why there's so much cynicism in the world. And that's why we identified love as a basic premise for healing in our communities because the same people that you grow up with in your childhood that are supposed to love you end up hurting you in one way or, for, or one way or another. And as of, a, as of a result, you end up carrying that with you wherever you go and you continually have this cynicism of love and what love looks like. Um, but that's kind of my response to that question. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to my panelists to take a stab at that as well. Yeah, if you don't mind me <clears throat> taking it next. Um, the reason why uh, we kind of, we took that stand on love being you know, a, a healing element in our communities is because uh, through the book, Bell Hooks mentions that in a place where true love exists, there can be no fear, uh, there can be no violence, there can be no abuse. And, you know, <clears throat> so that would really uh, take a lot of, a lot of the, um, a lot of the stuff away in our communities. If there was true love, uh, nobody would be afraid of the person who is next to them, uh, there would be no violence and, um, and there would be no hatred between people. Uh, for that question, I go back to that profound statement that Bell Hooks had, um, that love is an action. <clears throat> and I feel like there's a part in the book, I don't know her exact words, but she talks about how sacrifice is an important aspect of the love ethic because sacrifice requires action and sacrifice requires you being willing to put yourself last or to put someone else before you to obtain this common goal that we all have of unity and progress and justice. And <clears throat> seeing love as an action, I think puts it into perspective for, uh, like she was saying, for us to see ourselves as capable of being the ones to create change and to truly make a difference and to create a world where um, there's justice for everybody and there's equity for everybody and to create a world with fair opportunities and resources. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I, how I see that. Yeah, I completely agree with Alex and Roland. Um, I love that Roland mentioned that she mentioned in her book a lot that if there's violence or abuse in any relationship, there is no love whatsoever. Um, and I just love that she, you know, uh, explains that so well because it, it really is true. Um, I also, in the book, like I mentioned earlier, she said that if any public policy was made um, out of love, there wouldn't be homelessness or, you know, just elements of our world that wouldn't, that are wrong. Um, so just, I would just say like living, 
practicing the love ethic, if everyone did that, then our society would be just a loving society and there wouldn't really be any any uh, destruction. Um, but yeah, that's all I really have to say. <laughs> thank you for uh, the responses and thank you for the question. Uh, another question that has been posed to us is, what are some of the practical things you can do and are doing on your campus to move in that direction? I can go ahead and uh, try and say one one way that I believe we're doing these practical things um, is that us as the Carl Spain Center, um, we started these sort of like study club. Um, we had one previously last semester where we went through Bell Hooks book Salvation. And prior to that, we had started reading this book just as the Carl Spain Center, um, just with the interns and with Dr. Taylor. And I believe the first step in which we're trying to make this a reality is first we're educating ourselves. Um, a lot of the things that Bell Hooks has brought up are things that, you know, she brings them with this depth that you just can't ignore. It makes you question, you know, just your livelihood and how you were brought up and raised in a good way. It makes you seek out this truth of, yeah, was, was everything that I was taught actually loving? Was it actually a love that was pure and authentic? Um, and as a member of society today, how, how has that shaped the way in which I'm perceiving others? How has that shaped the way in which I'm perceiving myself, people that look like me and people that don't? So one way in which we have made steps into, you know, making this a reality is educating our minds um, and allowing ourselves to wrestle with these things. And through wrestling with these things, having open and honest and honest conversations with one another, um, having a, an event like this, allowing us to be vulnerable and, you know, giving ourselves these safe spaces in which we can talk about these things, not in a judgmental way, but in a way that's gracious and allowing us to process these things and interact with questions such as this. I believe this is a step. And like I had prefaced earlier, um, I'm not an expert, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I'm hoping that as I learn, as I allow myself to be in this in these spaces that push me out of my comfort zone to actually grow, I believe that's just one of the you know few steps that I'm taking and that we're taking together as a center to make a difference. Yeah, I completely agree. I was gonna say basically the same thing. Um, earlier in our presentation, I used a quote where um, Bill Hook said that openness and honesty is the heartbeat of love. So just like Kip was saying, um, events like this, or, you know, having, you know, those really deep conversations about things that controversial things that are happening in our world, um, just being honest and being vulnerable and, you know, telling your people, loved ones that you're uncomfortable when this happens, or, you know, just having conversations, things that, you know, ACU would never talk about before, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQA community, just things like that. Just being open and honest and having that conversation and know that you're doing it out of love, knowing that you're, that you wanted to educate yourself and educate others, learning about experiences and things like that. Um, but yeah, open, openness and honesty is, is something that, especially after I read this book that I tried to, that I value and I tried to use in my daily conversations or to use when I'm trying to practice the love, the love ethic. Um, but yeah, for sure. Just being open and honest is ways that we can, you know, cultivate the love ethic on ACU's campus. Kind of going off of what they said, just being willing to make sacrifices, sacrifice your time, your money even, <clears throat> and be willing to put yourself in situations that force you to educate yourself. Um, I bring it back to love as an action. So just, um, even just going out of your way to support organizations on campus that are led by uh, majority minoritized groups of people, uh, HU, BSU, <clears throat> ASA, and just, um, yeah, be willing, being willing to do the work and forcing yourself in situations, you know, just getting out there, I would say.
put your actions where your mouth is. All right. <clears throat> thank you for those responses and thank you for that question. Another question that um, has been posed to us is, you spoke a little about honesty, being a part of love. How important would you say honesty slash withholding truth from a loved one is? Also, are there times you would say where withholding truth may be to the benefit of a relationship, whether it be romantic or not? Who would like to go ahead and take a stab at that first? <laughs> I can try. Yeah. Um, I remember one part of her book, she mentions, it's in her honesty chapter. She mentions uh, she had a partner and her partner's sister had this like big family secret that she told that Bell Hooks was aware about. And her sister and the sister was like, don't tell, don't tell my, tell your partner. Don't tell my brother that this is happening. And Bell Hooks said that because I love him, I have to tell him this secret. Keeping it from him, being dishonest is not going to allow our, our relationship to go on. Um, I believe, and I believe that Bell Hooks believes that there's some things that you have to share with people that you love, even if it hurts them, that you, uh, you're sharing it with them because you love them. Um, and that's just practicing the love ethic. I think keeping anything from your, from your loved ones, romantic or not, um, just keeping that transpar transparency, um, even if it hurts them. That's what I believe. Um, and it, just know that it's out of love and, you know, it, not everything, not honesty doesn't bring destruction. Um, we're told that we have to be scared of the truth. The truth hurts, but it, it doesn't. It's what life is. It is what it is. Um, and I fully believe that. I don't know if that answers the question, but I feel like honesty is like you, you have to be honest with those who you love. And that just makes the relationship more transparent and, um, Honesty is just the heartbeat of love, as she says. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to add on to um, what you were saying, Marilyn, um, in that honesty chapter, she she definitely explores, you know, um, different relationships and, you know, there is that romantic aspect of it. And there's also those non-romantic aspects of how much honesty is a vital part in those relationships. and. She mentions how, you know, honesty and trust are crucial in a loving relationship. And you must be authentic about the way you feel without being insensitive to one another's feelings. So depending on what the thing is that you're withholding, um, just how destructive could it be? Um, how hurtful could it be to that person? And she basically says that you still have to figure out a way in which you can tell that truth, but also be sensitive. And depending on what those things you're choosing to withhold, um, eventually they're gonna, you know, hurt the relationship because she says at the end of it all, like, especially in a romantic relationship, trust is crucial. She says, trust is the foundation of intimacy and where lies when lies erode trust, genuine connection cannot take place. So when you're withholding these things in a romantic relationship, it's eating away at the intimacy of that as well. And eventually it will lead that relationship into destruction because lies cannot sustain life. Lies destroy and they kill. And at the end of the day, if we're honestly seeking to love a person, we have to be honest with them. We have to be, you know, seeking out their best. And I believe at the end of the day, everybody wants people that are honest with them. That even though they know that things could hurt, it's better to have those things brought out in the open and work to a way in which we can, you know, have grace, seek forgiveness and restore that relationship to a relationship that is stronger and more honest and one that you know lives in a spirit of truth have another question that says bell hooks often says that we all want love but are silent how can black people be vo be vocal about giving 
and receiving love. Due to the remnants of slavery, that sense of attachment and love was torn away. Because of that, I think we've been conditioned to see love as something that could create space to be harmed. So how do we begin to speak about love and the different ways we need it? I'll go ahead and read it one more time. Bell Hooks often says that we all want love, but are silent. How can black people be vocal about giving and receiving love? Due to the remnants of slavery, that sense of attachment and love was torn away. Because of that, I think we've been conditioned to see love as something that could create space to be harmed. So how do we begin to speak about love and the different ways we need it? Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and take a, take a shot at this one. Um, I believe that first loving ourself uh, would be the best way uh, to to go about bringing love back into a uh, a positive mind state in our community and also a more pro a, a more prominent part of our community because I do completely agree that that pop culture has has kind of not only desensitized love but also kind of demonized love as you said is making it something that you're opening yourself up to just be hurt that if you love somebody that ultimately they're just going to hurt you they're just going to take advantage of you you know all those all those bad stigmas that have been put um put around love but i believe that uh if we if we can love ourselves you know each of us will have a different experience with that and those who have learned to love ourselves when uh come together as a community they'll be able to share those experiences among each other and then hopefully be able to spread them uh, to the rest of our communities. Yeah, I can completely agree with Roland. Uh, yeah, I would say learn to love, love ourselves first. <clears throat> I think you can only love someone else as much as you, uh, or you can only love someone else well, as well as you love yourself. So just taking the time to get to know yourself and to be proud of who you are <clears throat> and to just yeah to be, be proud of your skin be proud be proud of your blackness your upbringing be proud be proud yeah yeah i completely agree i think loving yourself would definitely bring more love into the black community also like telling black men to stop being so tough and telling black women to stop being so strong I mean, there's these stereotypes that are put on black women and men that they have to be a certain way. And maybe if we stop telling them, telling black women and men to start to stop like following the stereotypes, then it will allow us to become more vulnerable and, you know, bring love into the black community and be proud of who you are, being proud of your blackness and for, like forever being proud of your blackness. Um, and yeah, starting, starting with that inner, with that inner self. Um, and that will allow you to love others, um, especially in the Black community. Black community is very broken, but if we bring more love in, then we'll become a community that is strong. Thank you for those responses. Another question that has been posed to us is, how does love apply to Black self-acceptance in the face of white supremacy? And how is Black self-love different from reverse racism. So the first question was, how does love apply to black self acceptance in the face of white supremacy? Um, I think I can go ahead and try to uh, give my perspective on that first question. Um, first of all, I think the reason that we first need to, you know, reinforce this black self-love is because white supremacy has done nothing but tried everything in its power to take that away from us. That's why we're on this consistent journey to bringing that back to the forefront of understanding, first of all, 
why was it necessary for them to steal that away from us? Why was that necessary? And we realized that at the root of it is because they were trying to dehumanize us. They understood the power of love. They understood how love is a very unifying thing, how it's a very powerful and transformative thing. And if we can suck that out of these, peop of these people, then we can control them. And black self-love in the face of white supremacy is definitely something that is gonna rub people that uphold white supremacy the wrong way. And the reason is because they see us reclaiming something that they have for so long used against us. They have taught us to love them, but not love ourselves. They, they turn us against each other. They would reward people that serve them, but that would cause so much division and destruction and allow us to continually not view ourselves as anything that could, could be lovable. And yeah, like what it looks like in the face of white supremacy, it's just gonna be something like this, something that, you know, is slow, but positive, but at the root of it is not vengeful. It's not, it's not being fueled off of hatred. It's being fueled off of that pursuit of what God had put in us. It's a spiritual pursuit. And at the end of the day, anybody that is continually trying to take that from you is somebody that is at war with God. And at the end of the day, I believe that they cannot win. What that would only do will allow us to grow stronger, allow us to continue to pursue it no matter what sort of hurdles they put in front of us. And at the end of the day, it's, it's love, it's beautiful. It will grow, it is attractive, it is contagious. And as we continue to love ourselves, it will only pass from us to another. And as long as we can continue to do that with our heads held, heads held high, I believe that at the end of the day, this demon that is white supremacy can be defeated. Um, in the last Carl Spain event, uh, Jamar Tisby spoke and something that he said that resonates with me that I'll probably take with me for the rest of my life is he said, your dignity is not up for negotiation. And black women, black men, your dignity is not up for negotiation. <clears throat> and I'll also say self-acceptance as a black person in America is huge. Like we don't need to help people legitimize white supremacy. We don't need to help legitimize those false narratives. Like we are black and beautiful, you know, be proud. Your dignity is not up for negotiation. And that's kind of my, my piece on that. Yeah, black love. Black love in America is definitely something that will always be attacked and it's something that has been attacked since uh, those first Africans were brought to American shores, you know, families were torn apart, um, children were taken away, uh, married couples were split and it's something that's still under attack today in the way of placing a low income black families in communities that have drug drugs in them and that have gun stores on nearly every corner uh that's because where black love does exist um, it usually comes with uh success and the uplift of black communities which obviously is complete failure of white supremacy and it's something that i definitely hope to see and something that uh, we as the Carl Spain Center are working towards. All right, and we have one last question that we'll uh, address and then we'll wrap up the session. <clears throat> Following Bell Hooks, Logic of Love, how can people learn to love others? 
who are in institutions without love. As a black kid growing up, I learned from an early age not to trust the police. Should black people like me try to actively love the police despite the negative relationship and the history of violence? Um, I, I can definitely relate to that. Um, I kind of ask that, I ask that question to myself every day. Um, I feel like the black community and police have a very interesting relationship. Um, I don't know, I, if I read this book and I try to practice the love ethic, then I would try to love the blue, blue lives as much as I love black lives, right? Um, that's, that's what Bell Hooks is calling us to do. And if I believe that, if I believe what she says is true, then that should, that should be what I, that should be what I should be practicing. So it is a challenge for sure, but if Bell Hooks is saying that we should love each other regardless of our differences, then we should try our best to. Very challenging, but yes, I think that Bell Hooks calls us to be uncomfortable, calls us to be vulnerable, um, and even in spaces where we have differences like that, then we should try our best to love. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Marilyn that if we're living by the love ethic and we're living by, um, and also by the Bible and spiritually and what God calls us to do, then we should definitely love cops, but we're also called to, you know, hold each other, sorry, to hold each other accountable. Um, so as, as much as we should love cops, we should also hold the cops who do the horrible things that cause the black community to be fearful and to kind of step back from them um, accountable. But we should not uh, demonize all cops and we should try to show them love. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, you know, choosing to love doesn't necessarily mean that we have to agree or accept everything that that person does. So in, in, the, in the terms of loving police officers, like we all know, like not all of them are bad cop, cops, but they are in this institution that is being used to, you know, target specific groups more than others. But at the end of the day, we still have to love them because they are humans. They are creations of God. They are um, people. They have families. They have things that, you know, if we got to know them, maybe on a personal basis, we could relate with them on so many levels. But at the same time, we have to hold them accountable. We have to speak that truth. We have to seek justice. We have to be honest with them. And when we do that, we can still reconcile that notion that how can I love people that I'm told, you know, to fear when we are challenging them to live up to this love ethic that we know is right and beneficial to society. We can still challenge them to pursue that. And hopefully when we engage them in, the, in these different ways, we can slowly be that difference that, you know, could lead them to make a difference in the other police officers that they engage with. We never know. Um, at the end of the day, all we can do is plant that seed. And as long as, you know, we have God on our side, he will continually give us that strength. I mean, at the end of the day, we live in a broken world. So all we can do is try and know that as long as we're living the truth of God, we can be at peace with that. Because at the end of the day, we all have to own up to our actions. We all have to own up to the decisions we make. And as long as we make the decision to love, I believe we're making the right decision. All right, I think that will conclude the feedback slash um, questions section of this uh, presentation. I wanna say thank you for everybody that has held on to uh, be a part of this up until now. Um, thank you for joining us and it honestly means a lot. Um, yeah, it was definitely a pleasure to be a part of this group, be a part of this panel and to showcase 
just some of the small things that we got from Bell Hooks, All About Love. Um, we highly recommend anybody that hasn't read the book yet to definitely try to do so. Um, it's very, very rich in its contents. And I believe that it can definitely be used for a lot of fruitful conversations. Um, at this point in time, I would like to invite Dr. Taylor to give us some last remarks before we close out the session. So Dr. Taylor. All right, thank you, Kip, uh, for doing an excellent job in leading uh, the panel. And I want to thank uh, Marilyn, Alex, and Roland uh, for doing an excellent job in participating in, in, the, in the panel and discussing this material. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to say very little love is visible in our nation today. Uh, love is the greatest power in all of the universe. Uh, the Apostle John described God as love. Um, African Americans have long been conditioned to display love and love for others while simultaneously feeling obligated to despise ourselves. If we are to get mentally, spiritually, physically, and socially healthy, we have to do so through the constructive and creative power of God's love. We must practice healthy self-love in order to overcome the negative conditioning that we have been forced to endure since the first African was brought here to the United States and reduced to the status of a brute animal. I believe that positive self-regard that aligns with God's assessment of our human value is the most revolutionary act available to any oppressed people. Our hope and our aim for this event was to make the strong case that black people must love everyone, but we must also be intentional about primarily including ourselves in the wide scope of that love. How can we genuinely love other people when we as a people suffer from a state of lovelessness towards ourselves and towards one another. Jesus teaches us that we must not love our neighbor less than ourselves. But however, he also teaches us that we must not love our neighbor more than we love ourselves. We're called to strike a healthy balance between loving our neighbor and loving ourselves. So um, wanted to share those uh, comments in closing that if anybody has a problem uh, with black people loving themselves, embracing ourselves, honoring ourselves, if you are against that, then you are against black people loving white people, Asian people and other, any other kind of people. Because if we don't take care of the home front in our own hearts as African-Americans undoing the hateful conditioning that we've been put under in the slave making process that was invented, owned and operated by the United States. Unless we can undo that, we won't be able to love ourselves or any other human being that walks on the face of this planet. So our task uh, is to now turn to our creator who is love and to apply that to ourselves and do it in a courageous fashion, not making any apologies for doing so. Because the better we do that, the more we are able to become healthy and the more we are equipped uh, to love others genuinely. If we love others and not love ourselves, that love is fake. It is as fake as a million dollar bill. And so, um, what we want to close out with now, and I'll give it back over to you, Kip, uh, to close us out. Uh, but remembering that in this space at Abilene Christian University, we hope that all uh, students of color, faculty of color, will understand that it is nothing against God's will in loving, embracing, accepting, and showing affection for ourselves as Black people. And then living from that center outward 
I think is the proper progress that will help us to be real, genuine, authentic, loving human beings that can love anybody beyond any particular uh, group or boundary. So thank you for attending and being a part of this event. And I'll turn it back over to you, Kip. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Taylor. That was beautiful. Um, at this point, I will just go ahead and close us out with the closing prayer. And I will end the session after that. But once again, thank you so much for being here um, for this event. It means a lot to us as a Carl Spain Center. And we definitely appreciate everything that um, you as an audience, you as a community do with us in pursuing ways in which we can be better as a community. So let's go ahead and bow down for a word of prayer and then I will end the session. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as we wanna to say, thank you for the time that you've given us to be here. Thank you for this presentation and thank you for the team that has worked on this. Thank you for the audience that um, showed up. Thank you for allowing them to be here with us, oh Lord. I pray that as we continue to grow, learn, um, engage with one another, I pray that we may continue to do it in ways that are beneficial, are wholesome, are transformative in the way we seek out to live your truth here on earth, oh Lord. Thank you for um, just giving us the wisdom to, to work with one another, to, to use the tools and resources available to us in ways that can cause multiplication and allow your truth to be spread out, oh Lord. I thank you for just everything that we've been blessed with. I pray that we may never take it for granted, oh Lord. And I pray that in this pursuit of finding love within ourselves, we will be consistently met by you. And we will allow you to consistently be that well in which we pull from so that we can love ourselves and love others and love with a love that is limitless. It's in your holy name I do pray and believe. Amen. All right. Thank you once again, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful day.